This is Real Learning with Real People. These conversations are with real people. They're unscripted and they're designed to pull tidbits of information from people who are grinding right now to get the most out of their lives. With minimum amounts of editing and maximum authenticity, we hope to provide lessons that anybody will find effective, relatable, and entertaining. We seek to have guests that provide learning that's based on their life experiences. Some are chosen because of their experience as high performers in sport, business, or education, and other guests have been chosen because they have meaningful lessons to teach, and I want to make sure they have the platform to share them with the world. The language in these videos is sometimes mature, as I'm always encouraging guests to just be themselves. This is all part of making sure that we do our best to give you content that is both authentic and effective, and that you truly feel like you can utilize the real learning and connect with these real people. Today I'm speaking with Dr. Afia Fredericks. Afia is the Director of Professional Learning at Mindset Works, where she supports her team by evaluating learning and development needs of customers, creating services and experiences that support organizations and schools, and really helping to nurture and deepen growth mindset culture across multiple groups. And if she's working at Mindset Works, then you know that she's right in the heart of growth mindset, which is really cool. She was introduced to growth mindset at the onset of her graduate school career, where she studied it throughout her master's and doctoral studies at Howard University. Dr. Fredericks is also an adjunct lecturer at Howard University, teaching research methods, statistics, introduction to psych, and others. Dr. Fredericks was born in the U.S. Virgin Islands and completed her bachelor's degree in psychology at the University of the Virgin Islands. Now, Afia is incredibly knowledgeable when it comes to a variety of really interesting topics. Our conversation really shows this as it branches across many different areas. She works with high-level people every day, and as I continue to get to know people who know her, she's extremely well-respected by by these high performers. Here's my extremely engaging talk with Dr. Afia Fredericks. Dr. Afia Fredericks, how are you today? I am good, I am good, Ken, and yourself? I'm very good. I'm not talking about the weather on this episode to open the intro because I've done it on almost every one, <laughs> which I think I just violated. <laughs> um, I'm, so this is your first, first podcast. Ever in YouTube my life. Show. And the hardest part, I think, is taking off your kind of media mask or your, and, and for mo and I don't mean for you, I mean for me and for everybody who's ever on here, because I do the fake intro, and then for the next, like, two or three minutes, I'm like, hey, now, like, now we're just talking. <laughs> and there's a little recording thing flashing in the corner. So I'll, I'll try to keep you in that headspace as much as possible, but. Appreciate um, it. This is a very serious setting where we will not laugh or talk about anything that's not directly related to my very specific target market, which is everybody. <laughs> so <laughs> sorry, sorry, wait. Oh, I also almost just knocked over a plant. So that would have been, <laughs> would have been a great, great start to the show. Um, I like to get the first part underway as fast as possible because I think that it's the most the most easy for all of our guests to talk about and i also think that it's the most interesting um to me guest to guest is hearing about this part so tell everybody a little bit about your background your upbringing where you came from your family environment and your framework for life that you kind of developed early on oh okay all right where did it all begin um so i was born and raised on st croix united states virgin islands uh and grew up there was a product of the public school system my parents my mom she was a social studies teacher middle school teacher uh, and you can imagine how that was growing up with the teacher and her school was literally from my elementary school we we used to run to the, the middle school and back for for pe so <laughs> literally right up the street like and I remember she would just kind of stop in randomly and you never know when she would come. And like your friends would say, Hey, I think I saw your mom, my mom, what is she doing here? And the funny thing is I remember being a senior in high school and my mom doing the same thing. And I was like, mom, mom, I'm graduating. You know it. I know it. We know it. Why are you here? <laughs> But that was my mom. She was really big on education. She, you know, she really made sure that me and my siblings, so I have two siblings, a younger sister, older brother. And as an educator, as someone who really believed in the power of knowledge, uh, she made sure that we had the tools that we needed. And so I remember there was no 
there was no watching TV during the week. Um, we couldn't go outside unless we had completed all of our work. And if there was no work, we're lying because there's always work because we should be studying or reviewing notes, you know? So that was, that was my mom and my dad. He was actually a military brat and he was in a business. Uh, so he was in like human resource. He was a human resource manager um, within the government, the USBI government, and then with a um, oil company, Hovenza. And he was just more laid back. He was chill. Um, he was kind of the fun parent, probably because he wasn't around as much. So <laughs> we got to, you know, uh, we weren't, I guess he didn't have us all the time. And so he could enjoy us a little more. Um, yeah, he was just more free flow, fun. Let's just talk, you know, let's just chill. So he was kind of like, the, if we think about good cop, bad cop. He was a good cop, mom was a bad cop, you know. Um, but he was really into sports and so volleyball. And I remember growing up playing sports, being into volleyball, basketball. I did a little bit of that. I ran track. There was a boy that I liked. He was on the team. So naturally, he joined. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, made all of those rookie mistakes, you know, but I learned lots from them. Don't get me wrong. I'm glad I, I had the upbringing I did and um, made those mistakes um, early on. And also I was really, my mom was really big into the church. So I would be in church Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, maybe not Thursday, Friday and Saturday, definitely. And Sunday, absolutely guaranteed rain or shine. I was there. Um, so for me, the church was, they were like my extended family. And so it was really cool growing up in that space. Didn't think of, of it in that way. Then I felt it was a little torturous, you know, but it really gave me a strong foundation in terms of morals and ethics. Um, and so that was, that was nice to have that um, kind of foundation laid um, mm. to set me up. So, cool. yeah. And so what did, I guess, I guess what I like to come back to first is, and this is sometimes really hard and sometimes really easy. Mm -hmm. If you had to describe mom in a word, where would you go with that? In one word? One word. <sighs> um, uh, that is a difficult one. Um, she was, <sighs> I'm thinking like educator. I'm thinking, then I'm also thinking disciplinarian. It's really hard. Educanarian. I like that. <laughs> combined yeah. i can create She's like disciplinarian educator so it was i it's a toss up there it's kind of hard for me i to wrote say. down educanarian so <laughs> that's what we doctors do we we create things, you know? <laughs> we're knowledge producers <laughs> why i <laughs> well i don't know if this one will be easier or harder than what about dad awesome <laughs> sorry <laughs> Sorry, my mom would probably be like rolling her eyes and sucking her teeth right now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> she would. Uh, yeah, he was. He was. He was my biggest supporter. I'll say that he was uh, supportive, just awesome, awesome man. He was just amazing. I, I. Yeah, yeah, and he's no longer, you know, here. So he passed. Uh, few years ago about eight years ago so but he was awesome it's pretty yeah. awesome just well, gonna then, say that. can't argue like he was awesome <laughs> i think i think that it it brings up something that i'm seeing it's trending in this this show especially but also in people that we haven't had on yet um or maybe won't ever but is that there's a parental yin yang that's pretty common through a lot of people that that are what I would describe as having them on the show as, as pretty effective or, or strong learners, educators, that, that kind of thing, whatever you want to title all, the entire group that have been on, where there's a, there's a pretty clear yin yang in every parental environment. And some of them are there. And then the other side of it is not there, right? Like mm -hmm. we've definitely had that as a, 
as a as a setting and the to one of the guests that i that i had where it was a parent that was involved and a parent who left and was never involved again i said like is it and i might be being uncouth but is it fair to say that the presence of the yin yang teaches more than than any environment where everything's the same where both parents are like on it like they're the exact same type of personality Mm -hmm. both disciplinarians no fun or both super fun and never really having a ton of structure or anything like that and he was the one who was like yeah actually i i think i learned a lot more and got a lot more from my parental structure if you want to call it that where i didn't have a father really than many of the people i know who had two parents who were around and loving and caring it's not addressing any of that but yeah. we're both very like laissez-faire and that kind of thing. What do you think about that? Yeah. Well, I think that, I think balance is important. I, I don't, I think too much of anything. I mean, think about water, too much water, you drown. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, I mean, well, it's more complicated than that, but too much of it <laughs> isn't a good thing, you know? So I definitely think the balance is great. Cause I think about if I had, if I was, Oh man, if I, if it was only my mom, I don't know. I, don't, I uh, you know, not having enough of that softer understanding leniency with my dad, I would have probably like broken out and, you know, yeah, yeah. I just would have been a different person for sure. But with my dad, he was the one, if there were, there was a dance or something, you know, I'd be like, dad, can I, can we get to the dance? Please? <laughs> you know, and that my dad, he would like, he would take us and like wait for us, you know, and like, all right, got, make sure you're back at this time. And, and so he allowed us to do a lot more, but my mom was a teacher. So when I was on the computer with, I am messing with, I don't even remember what it was at that time when computers had just come out, of course. Um, she was aware of what we were using it for because she would listen to her students in the classroom. And she was like, what are you guys doing on the computer? Because if you don't have work, you need to get off. Because I know you guys are in chat. You know, I know you guys do these things. So she was a lot more aware of what people my age and, you know, were doing. So I definitely think it's important to have that balance because I would have probably been a Whew, I'd have learned a lot more lessons, a lot more difficult, you know, in a more difficult way had I only had my dad because I'd have just been a free or just yeah. oh, doing whatever, you know, um, because he allowed that freedom. So I definitely agree that I think both are are super important um, to have. And also, I think it's interesting because you hear a lot about the absentee father's Um, and I don't think you hear a lot about the effects of having a present mom who might be stressed and overworked Mm -hmm. and feeling underappreciated, um, and what that does to a child. But I think what's even more interesting is having a similar dynamic with two parents in the household where a mom assumes a lot of the responsibility, sometimes that's part of what was passed down to her. She believes that as a mother, I have to do everything. Um, and maybe the man, you know, believes that, that that's her job as well, or I'm bringing home the money and you do everything. And maybe at one point that was true because the women weren't necessarily working or working, you know, similar hours, but, you know, fast forward a couple of decades, we're working full-time jobs as well and some of us still assume those traditional roles as women um which can kind of mimic in a sense not completely because you have the financial backing of another person which is substantial in a two-parent household but a a woman can still be stressed still feel underappreciated and and all of that even within so i think there's so many different um uh kind of combinations that we don't I don't think we explore enough so beyond the absence of a father um Mm -hmm. the presence of the stressed mom and her ability to parent and or the limited ability to do so because she's focused and concerned with other things and what that impact is on the child because we you know it's there's there's a lot that I don't think we we address but I think it's the last thing I'll say because I've been talking for a minute now. But I really believe that overall, I think it's important for us as adults to be aware of how our upbringings, presence and absence and traumas, et cetera, in childhood, how they've had an effect on us to be 
aware of those things and be able to begin the process of healing from that and working on ourselves as we go forward as to not repeat the cycles and to do things better than were done before. And um, I had just put up a post today on, on, on Facebook and it said, my best and your best might not be the same. The resources that I have available to me and those that you have available to you may also be different, but I do believe that people are doing the best that they can with what they have. Um, yeah. yeah, that's... I really believe that. Yeah, I like, I like that. That's tight. And I, th I think that it's... it's I have, a, I have a friend and he often says his, his dad left when, when they were very young. And he says the best thing my dad ever did for me was leave. He's like, uh -huh. he was, he was not good. Like he, and the fact that he identified that. He, he, we don't hear that a lot either. No. That, that's your yeah. thing. We don't hear that a lot. Yeah. And, and he's, he's like, I, my stepdad is one of the best people I know. And I never would have met him and I would have had a really toxic man in my life. He's like, so he's like, don't get me wrong. I had a lot of stuff around him leaving and I still yeah. sometimes struggle with aspects of it. It's like, but I turned this corner where I, I really found this place, which was like, well, what would it have looked like if he stayed? He probably would have abused me. And, and this is like, he knows the man more than anybody else. I don't know him at all. Yeah. his words but it's like he probably would have abused me or at least he would have been miserable my mom would have been miserable he would so he left and i i appreciate that i have a i he's like he's like i've written that down as a something that i'm gratuitous for not something that i'm bitter about and i i think that that really further to your point it's like there once was the time where everybody wanted the quote unquote nuclear family and i don't even want to dive too far into that term but now it's like now it's there's so many different versions and understanding them all but i do think that what you're saying is true which is that too much the too much of a good thing concept does hold and mm -hmm. and i think it kind of connects me a little bit to to something that you said when you were talking about your mom being a teacher and now i'm gonna have talked for much longer than i want to talk which is <laughs> which is that i also have a mom who is in education works for works for the board and so she was in and out of schools all the time and so one day me and my friend play hooky from the school to go <laughs> to the ball candy store this is in high school so i'm like 16 which is smart enough to know that my voice sounds a lot like my dad so that i could call the school and say that my son has an appointment like this was a well that we didn't just go this was a planned thing and we were going to get away with it <laughs> and so we go and we come back and we're thinking we're getting away with it I'm walking down the hallway and all I see is my mom's head come out of the office door like, hey, so the secretary's just told me that uh, dad took you for an appointment. <laughs> and I'm just kind of like, but I, I, what that br brings up for me and you're, you talk about your mom and being so close and in and out all the time is that there's a line and I think it's applied more and it's applied unfairly more often to mothers than fathers, but there's a line between overbearing and caring. And I think every relationship familial or non, whatever, however you want to describe them, mm -hmm. we walk the line between overbearing and caring. Yeah. And I'm interested to kind of hear what that means to you. And if there's, if, if you want to pull from childhood, that that's fine. But I, I just feel that that pulled on it for me because my mom always was on the caring side of the line. Like that, like that, there's no doubt in my mind. That's how even reflecting on it, that that's where she was. And because of that, I think I have a very clear understanding of the difference between the two sides. What about you? Yeah. I, I think that's interesting because when I think of the terms overbearing and caring, and, and then I think about childhood, I really want to say that that's, it may depend on the child and how they perceive what's being given to them. Because I, I sit and I talk to my siblings often, you know, about us growing up and we, we had you know, our parents are the same <laughs> but we perceive the interactions and the relationships differently and to some extent who our parents 
are to us, it's a little different. Um, as we are, you know, different as individuals, you know, we all kind of have our unique personalities and quirks. And so thus, my parents interacted with our different personalities differently. And so where I felt I didn't get enough of something, you know, my siblings might have felt like, no, we got enough of that. But what, what happened to you? <laughs> I'm yeah, like, yeah. no, I didn't. Or I think also about how like now as an adult looking back, you know, I look at how my mom, her style of dealing with certain things, um, you know, as a disciplinarian, as an educator, you know, very strict and, you know, what are you doing? And that's not the expectation. And, and my interpreting that in some ways as not being enough when that was not her intention, you know, in terms of the standards that she held for us. But my siblings didn't necessarily take that from her rearing and how she disciplined us and her standards. They didn't take that per se, but for me, you know, as the the talkative, inquisitive child I was, you know, it was just like, oh my goodness, and, and wanting to please and you know, if I can only make mommy happy and I got to do this and I got to, you know, and so I was a different child. I was a child when we were home and um, my mom maybe went down the road to come back. I would be the one, guys, that's clean. Let's clean because she's going to love it. <laughs> my sister who's five years younger who, you know, just, she was the baby, you know, so she, I mean, the, the, the standard wasn't the same for her, right? I'm the eldest girl, thus I need to clean everything and cook. Well, cooking wasn't a requirement, which now I wish it were. But I was, you know, expected to do a lot more. My brother, I mean, he was really a good child. I mean, not that they're bad children, but he just always deferred to doing the right thing. You know, I'll just say that. <laughs> that was just his MO, like, I'm just going to do what I'm supposed to do. What does uh, he do now? Um, he is a process tech at a oil refinery, um, process operator, process operator, oil refinery in Texas. Um, it's so funny because even now in his adulthood, he's very much, there's rules and things have to be a certain way, which is interesting because I think it worked really well for us when we're younger, you know, um, you know, as you're good, bad, right, wrong. It's, it's, it's simple. It helps us to make you know, decisions in a seamless way. But as we get older, you realize how much gray there is. You know, it's like, is it really black or white though? <laughs> so it's, it's interesting to see how, who we are as, as children, how that plays out as we get older and um, how some of those things or elements are still there. You know, I was an inquisitive child um, growing up and now I just love asking questions and, you know, and research and, you know, attaining a PhD, lifelong learning. Like, that's my, that's my, can we curse here? Oh, yeah. yeah. That's my shit. You know what I mean? Like, I love that. Yeah. So then I have my sister who was, um, she was just, I thought she was just rebellious. Because things I dare not do, like I didn't, it's just like, you, you're doing what? Don't do that. You know, she was just like, I'm going to do it. Right. But my mom is older and tired by the time she came along. So, you know, um, she couldn't run after her. You know, my mom wasn't as fast at that time. But um, my brother, you know, he, again, he, by the rules for the most part, and he still kind of lives by that like this is what you do and this is what you don't do to some degree so it's really interesting to see how elements of who we are they are kind of still there and it's almost as though you think about meditation and mindfulness and all of these practices now and you wonder are we trying to get back to who we really are like that part of us that was there when we were young and kind of innocent like are we is that what we're trying to get back to because you look at children and I have a son and he's two and he is more or less always in that moment. He could have just like fell out, ah, 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 you know, and uh, hey, you want some candy? You want a lollipop? Yep. Yes, mommy. Yes, please. It's like, I thought you were in pain. He's like literally in that moment all the time. Like it doesn't matter what happened. 
he's not in the past. He's not, I mean, not yet, right? Like he's two, I guess. I don't know what's that threshold. Once they pass that, you know, then we just, uh, but it's so interesting. I, I Sometimes I wonder if we're trying to get back to, to, to ourselves, right? We're, we, we, you know, there's, there's an essence of us that I don't know if it leaves us, but I think experiences society, even our parents, but I, I, I hold the belief that they even, they were definitely doing the best that they knew how to do at that time. And, you know, as you, you get older and you become an adult, then it's our responsibility to, to, to really dive into what the effects of the parenting, rearing, et cetera, the experiences that we had were good, bad, or indifferent. I, I, I would like to think that my parents had the best of intentions, but because I was who I was, I didn't always receive it in that way or process it in the way that they intended it to be um, received. And so that also leads to a, a whole lot of, of um, I guess, challenges. But I think it was Jada Pinkett Smith on Red Table Talk. And I think she said something like, all of our kids are going to need therapy, you know, mm-hmm. just comforted. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Whether we intended to create trauma or hurt or it happened, you know, and I think if you think about just the process of learning and growth, um, I would think that all of that happens to to provide us with opportunity. And some of us don't want to deal with it. Some of our traumas are deep and we would rather not go there. But I think that's the key to really moving forward, elevating and and thriving to really be able to deal with with those experiences, traumas, etc., to grow from. They're like ripe opportunities to grow. But you know, pressure makes diamonds. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just slide that in there. Uh, <laughs> I so I just kind of as I was actively listening and not writing in my notebook. Um, I came to this thought that that was directly connected to well, everything you were just saying. And I, it's a controversial thing that, that again, like I said before we came on, I'm, my new theory is if I'm controversial, I can do anything, even be president of the United States. So I, uh, <laughs> the, the thought that school is where we start our journey towards stopping to learn. Oh, crap. <laughs> Now what? let me let me quantify it. Yeah, please do. <laughs> That's deep. Yeah. So, and I, and maybe I took this. So, if somebody's watching this and they're <laughs> really famous and and uh, watching this because as they consider sponsoring the show or giving my company money or something like that, because as, sense, as yeah. many people do, uh, I'll give you credit for this after. So don't turn it off. But. Uh, yeah, so school is where we start our journey towards stopping learning. It, to me, what that what that comes up, and I've talked about this in front of schools and groups of teachers and stuff like that before, which is that the minute that we start sitting in desks and 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 in classrooms and in in buildings, and it's getting better, where we're restricted to certain flow, we're restricted to certain ceilings, both literal and metaphorical all of a sudden we think that we learn only in this in the setting that learning is given to us and then we spend 18 year or 14 year whatever depending on your school structure um we spend a a little over a decade where learning happens at least in terms of like the verbiage and that kind of stuff and and the intent to learn happens inside this box of a school inside this box of a classroom sitting at this box of a desk and then we go out into the world and the majority of people don't ever do it again because they're not in school anymore which is the place where learning happens in your mind Mm. and so uh, like just riff a little bit like it just just that idea i guess that something you you asked the question as you were talking that's that I don't know where they lose that, like your son and, and, and being able to just be in the moment. Like, I don't know where they lose that, like unconscious mindfulness. Um, <laughs> and that, that ability to just be present regardless and to switch, like, this is happening now, this is happening now. Yeah. I, it did hurt, but now there's candy. So I don't care about the hurt anymore. Right. What, what do you think about the, like, 
maybe maybe I'm totally off. Maybe like, and I do think this is an aggressive. I'm taking a pretty hard stance and against mm-hmm. school per se, but I'm, that's <laughs> not what I'm intending to do. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it is. See, it, this is a difficult one because I have this these kind of two schools of thought in my head, in my mind. On one end, personally, as someone who is privileged enough to be born into a family of two educated individuals from you know middle to um, middle low middle class. Um, and, and, and being educated myself, knowing the value of education. Um, I, I feel like with my experiences and knowledge, I really believe that learning doesn't start, you know, the minute the child sets foot in school. I, I feel like as a parent, I have an obligation to my child to ensure that the learning is happening from me first. Um, contrary to what some may believe. Not me. But, <laughs> Go on. But I also recognize that everyone did not have the privilege that I had because I think birthing is a lottery system. You don't choose who, what family, what environment, what situation you're going to be born into, whether you, you're born in, into love or not. You know, like you don't choose that. And so with that in mind, everyone does not have parents who believe that and who feel that way. So I do think there is a need for an education system, so to speak, because I think about inequity and I think about children who are literally at the hands of the adults that are responsible for them. So what happens to them if we're like, your parent, they need to do it. You know, like that's their responsibility. Um, so I see it that way, but I, I also, you know, with my, I guess, privilege hat on, I, I agree that something happens in terms of the formal, formal education system. And I, I can speak more to the public school system as I was a product of that. I'm more familiar with that. Um, but I know there are more, there are different types of systems. You have the Montessori and, you know, um, there are a lot of different education systems that people transcribe to. It's interesting because I was recently reading a chapter in the history of intelligence and I started to read about the history of the bell curve. And I think what's really fascinating is how both really have a foundation in social Darwinism, Mm. which was the heart of the eugenics movement, right? And so when you think about like Stanford Binet's test, you know, his test wasn't um, created or designed initially to essentially identify the superior intellectual individuals. It's actually to do the exact opposite. His test uh, was essentially designed to identify those who needed support the most, who were d- severely deficient. That was the intention of that test that then you get into the hands of different people who believe, hey, survival of the fittest. Some of some individuals are way more intelligent than others, um, and we need to weed that out, right? And so the whole eugenics movement was about how do you eradicate, essentially, or not allow those who have deficient genes to continue to reproduce, hence sterilizing thousands of people. Um, and using Stanford Binet, you know, the Stanford Binet test to do that. Or when immigrants came in from, you know, came to Ellis Island, given that test, to essentially possibly send some people back because you're intellectually, you're di- inferior and we don't want that in, in this country. Um, and so it was just really sickening to hear how they were using this test. And then there was one guy, I can't remember his name, but he was very instrumental in um, you know, the eugenics movement. He then became, I think, the president of the college board and started that SAT. And I'm like, whoa. The found, I mean, when you think about the foundation and, and, and acknowledging that we've come a long way, but 
the tools that we're using and the system that we're using, it's almost like there's something that's broken and um, it's like, hey, where's that Band-Aid? Let's just put that on. The, hey, let's just patch this up over here. Let's patch that up over there. Um, and so I, I think we've been doing a lot of patchwork. We've made strides in terms of, you know, some of the changes incorporating SEL and growth mindset. There's a lot of, of really great things out there, but it's so interesting because it's like we're adding things onto this system that's broken and some of it just doesn't align and it doesn't match. So we talk about potential, unlimited potential and learning, growing over time and mistakes being integral in that process. But the system isn't set up to support that for the most part. You have individual educators that are passionate, knowledgeable about what they do, and they choose to create those environments within their classrooms for the students that are fortunate to enter their classes, right? Yeah. So it, it, it's, 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 it's difficult. I don't have the answers. I just have these pieces that the more I know, the more complex and complicated it gets for me, but the the less easy for me to just make a definite, yeah, this is wrong. This is, you know, in terms of this is what we should do. This is what I still, I wonder what, it, what, what is the answer? And, and I'm not sure what it is, but I do know that there is some, there's a lot of truth to that statement that you made. And it's a lot behind it, even with the, the bell curve, right? That assumption that this is, how it shows up in nature this is natural that only a few can be really exceptional and only a few are going to be at the opposite end and most people are just average and so you know you think about fixed mindset this is where it is this is where you're at this is what it's going to be don't 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 do any more because you got most of you going to be here in this big average area that's where you're going to be why should i you know invest any more into you because I, I believe that only a couple are exceptional and can do really, you know, can achieve highly. So I acknowledge and accept that most of you just ain't going to be shit. <laughs> That's I'm, I'm laughing out of fr like a frustration kind of <laughs> like you're, you're too right. It's, it's tough, but you, you, so you, you went to, you went to college. I'm sure there was at least one class that you were sat in or at least one professor on your campus that said look to your left look to your right what's that about yeah. hmm? i actually i had and and this was an exception to i've i've been very fortunate to have unreal educators which i think is why i care so much about what i'm doing now but i did have one who i asked question on day one and he told me to shut the f up and ask questions once I've actually had a chance to get by the textbook and read the textbook and that kind of thing. And the question was literally just like something along the lines of just looking at this outline, sir, like, we, like that was, that was a part of our culture in our, in our setting. It's not in all of them, but so just quick question about this assignment, sir, coming up at the end. And before I even finished, that was his, that was his kickback. So it's the same kind of, and, and the same person would brag about like this class is a weed out class. If you don't get through this, get ready. Like it's, right. I'm, I'm going to do. It sounds like the professor's ego if you ask me. Oh yeah, totally ego. And, and I've had colleagues since that I disagree with fundamentally on a few different aspects of teaching, but it's like, I am like the, the colleagues who brag about how hard it is to pass their class. It's like, so you're a barrier to learning. Like if, like the, especially if the content's already hard, like if you're teaching, like we've, I, I've taught with, and, and I've taught things like anatomy and physiology and exercise physiology, not concepts that everybody just walks in. They're not the hardest concepts in the world, but they're, they're not concepts that people just are like, yeah, I know that. Like the yeah. sky's blue, grass is green. And the humerus is attached to the radius and the ulna, right? Like nobody, not everybody's, not everybody's putting that together. So it's, it's amazing to me the amount of people that brag or see achievement in making learning difficult. Yeah. I, I don't know what that's about. I, I, I mean, I have a couple of theories in terms of, you know, 
what is that playing into? Like, how, how does that serve that person, that professor? Because I feel like that's the only person it serves unless individuals really believe that that's, that's how they interpret challenge is a precursor or a potential supporter of learning. Like maybe this, like, I got to make this class hard um, because you got to learn. But oftentimes I don't find learning to be at the, the, the core of that type of behavior. Um, because when you think about the science of learning, think about what research has shown about expectations, beliefs that we hold. Um, you know, you have the pig, Pygmalion effect, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, think about, it's like the science of learning. When you, when you think about that, it's like there's, what's supporting, what's, what's the, the basis of that, that that school of thought what is that founded on and and ego right now is the only thing i can that can come to mind because science doesn't support it but what's interesting about the education system as well i'll say let's think about like the medical system right look at how quick look at look at what's happening right now look at how quick research just gets churned out <laughs> and applied right and i would and and the reality is we take you know, the medical field very seriously, right? Because that's life or death. And so that research, like as quick as the research happens, is as quick as the changes happen because the stakes are high, because it's life or death. Well, I would also argue, and I know my, um, <laughs> my, my dissertation advisor, he always said this, um, Dr. A. Wade Boykin, uh, Howard, he would also say, well, I would argue that education is also life and death mm. right i mean on different levels literally mm. because think about the school to prison pipeline um and then think about our futures how america and the world is, is shifting and changing and the need like our children they are the future and and it's so interesting because i've heard that all the time and it just sounds great you know it just rings up has a nice ring to it children of the future you know there's songs and you know i mean it sounds great but when you think about that on a deep level and sometimes when i um when i am uh, uh conducting professional development i i say to educators think about imagine if you looked at each student as your future caregiver hmm? You in that nursing home and, and you look up and you see John or, or, you know, Suzanne or Trisha or, right? Like you, you look up that student that you had, like imagine if they were going to be your next caregivers, how differently would you interact, treat them? Um, you know, how, how differently would that be? You know, that experience. So I, I, I think on multiple levels, education should also be viewed as life or death. And thus, as research is happening to talk about what is going to you know, support learning, I know it's difficult, it's tough, because there's so much that um, has, has come out over time. You know, think about the self-esteem movement. You know, that was a real thing. Uh, so I, I know it's challenging, but I, I think we... we I think maybe education and research can do a better job at working together. And so there's not that significant lag behind, you know, when research comes out and when in education as a field, we choose to support the work, right? Even like growth mindset, you know, how many decades Carol has been at this for and her colleagues. Yeah. Right. And then think about schooling now and, and, and how much of that, to some degree with some in, you know, some parts of the globe, it's still like, really? Wow. That's... Oh, yeah. So I think we have a long way to go. I mean, I think we're going, we're going, you know, but there, there's, there's still, there's still a lot more we can do. And I think just awareness, education, it's like, there's an education part in terms of the learnings that we need to continue to do, but then it's also doing a better job at sharing the knowledge and the information and um, making sure the people that really need it can receive it. We, we uh, administer, provide, share um, with individuals that really are not getting the messages that need to, you know, um, then there's also the political level policies that need to be changed. And there's a lot of things, a lot of work to do, but I think we're making strides. 
just by having this conversation is actually, I think, you know, yeah. part. Of it. And I, th I think too, that brings up, and we've kind of talked about this, uh, that w our work a lot of times is w we work with sport business and education sectors. And we, the reason why we work with them and soon to be the creative sector as well. But the, the reason why we work with them is because we make the argument to all of them that they're related to the other two and that mm. there's crossover. And I'm gonna generalize and potentially um, be controversial again to <laughs> just swaths of people here and say that I have a problem with the way that I see from the outside, from not living there or, or working there, that America views education and healthcare in the sense that I don't know how many times I'm watching on TV and I get, I get the quantity of information, the type of information I'm getting when I watch that. And somebody calls a student or a patient, a client or a consumer. I hear it all the time in, in American media. I'm not saying it doesn't happen, but I'm hearing it because I rarely hear it in our media here in Canada. I rarely hear it on BBC and in, in Europe. And it's the, the consumer and client title is thrown around like crazy. And it's like, well, hold on. In my mind, if somebody's a client or a consumer, you are providing them some, with something that means that they're gonna need you forever. Like you want, like now it's a business mindset. So I'm trying to give you something that you're going to come back for over and over and over again. But there in no universe is that what medicine and education is supposed to be. It's supposed to be, I'm going to give you something that's going to make you so good. You never need me again and you don't need to come back and you can do it on your own. Yeah. These are two conflicting <laughs> views here. Capitalism, man. It's and and I, I'm not, I think, I think that it actually feeds into the same capitalism kind of concept long-term, kind of like what you're talking about, um, which is that when we, if we really make more of our students self-sufficient enough learners that they can be more creative and, and employ things like design thinking on a high level and all that kind of stuff, they're going to create businesses and products that are way better than what we have now. But if we make it where they think that learning starts at pre-K or grade one or what it, where, whatever the system is and ends at grade 12 or ends at a four-year college degree or ends at a, well, now we're just creating people that are, that are pretty one-dimensional and, and not necessarily going to continue that learning and that creation and that production long term so it, it just i guess it's a bit of a tangent but i really i really do kind of feel like the view of a, of a patient and a student as anything but somebody that you're trying to train to not need you anymore is dangerous to capitalism and it's dangerous to a lot of stuff beyond that too that is true that is true and i i also see how it actually ties right in and it comes full circle um, to what I was saying earlier, because if you think of, you know, the origins of the system that we have, part of it, like moving out from the, I, I have a hard time pronouncing this word, the agrarian, uh, you know, when we were agrarian. big on agriculture yeah, and yeah. Yeah, planting and cotton and all of that stuff. Um, yeah. yeah, but when we moved into the industrial era, right, like you need workers, so if you need workers, everybody can't be, you know, like you think about the system and you think, and so on one end, yeah, you want innovation. We want, you know, um, we're preparing kids for a future unknown ultimately, but at the same time, if you think about how the system kind of began and the idea that we, everybody can't be you know, are the highest achievers and doing great and on a track to tech and programming and, you know, and, and the reality is you're going to need diversity, but I would argue that we're born with that. Like, think about what makes you come alive versus the next person, the next person, right? And I guess I'm pulling from the alchemist now because it's just amazing. I can see it. I can literally <laughs> see it in the front behind you right now. <laughs> 
<laughs> I'm this is a big plug for Paulo Coelho. I love you. <laughs> this is like the fifth or sixth time that I, I'm gonna put it back just in case someone like just like for, fast forwards it, and I just want to make sure they can see that just yeah. in case. But um, <laughs> like coming back to like those principles of us all having purpose and passion and a personal legend and you know and and knowing that they're all different right mm. and so i think that within us it's it's already there that diversity in terms of interests and unique passions and you know i i just feel like there has been um i don't know how what degree to, to today it's still the case but there has been this kind of artificial we need to well tracking that was a big thing and to some extent we do it still right yeah. but tracking was big because you know we need people out there in field we need people flipping them burgers and we need right so that was big and, and remember this is like the, the foundation of the system that we have and so again we're the band-aid thing like yeah. and, and thinking about the system and what it was intended to do honestly sometimes i i i think about you know, when you think about like oppression and systems of oppression and thinking that the system that was essentially built on the rhetoric that you, you're not, you weren't even a person, a, a human being, expecting that system to then somehow, you know, save you, take you out of that place. It's, that's not what it was intended to do. And we can band-aid it, we can change this, tweak that. But at the end of the day, the system is the system. And, you know, the 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 underpinnings it's it's still there it's systemic right yeah. and so i i feel it's the same type of way and it gets muddied up and murkied up when you throw money in that because education is a billion dollar industry you know and even the medical profession i mean think about the pharmaceutical company there's money in it and so the the it, it's so difficult because that's that's the world that in america is we're you know capitalism and other countries as well and so i think the the challenge is balancing the better greater good um with with profits and gain and and how do you balance both because i don't think we're we're about to open up this country okay. and not because it's it's safe right so i mean it's just this constant war between money and the economy which the, it's it's important right no doubt like none of us are you know working with the intent that we'll never make money i mean or you know supporting and educating and and just being okay with never making a dime like that's just not that's not real to think that we're just here giving up our time and our energies for just the love of it because we still need to survive um and so I think that's the, that's the big challenge. Again, the more I learn, the more questions I have, the more I realize how much I don't know and just makes me want to learn even more. And this is this big cycle of like questions and you know, that well, I think, I think you literally just, uh, almost verbatim quoted Dr. Kendra Coates, our, <laughs> our mutual friend. Cause I think she said, I think she said the same thing in her episode. Here is her book. It's probably it's 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 never. I'm sorry. I'm plugging everybody. Kendra oh. Cole, growth, girls guide to growth mindset. I just love it. And mindsets is definitely here as well. Where is mindsets? You know what? That's a that's a really good book just to have. Period. Especially yeah. now during this quarantine. Let's just all just get our reading together. Here we go. There it is. Carol do it. Yeah, these books. are what I need is a a proper bookshelf. Okay. That's and I'm all the really. That. Like the people that are that do this regularly, they're always in front of their bookshelf. Oh, and my know. question is, have you read them? And <laughs> do you and do you do you actually put the ones that make you look more like so if I'm on a sports show, do I move all my books that are about sports behind the camera? But then mm -hmm. if I'm on something else, do I move them to the back and the other ones get in behind me? That's such a great question. I don't know, but my books are thrown all about because I'm actually reading them. <laughs> and that's what I'm saying. Like, <laughs> I, I guess this isn't a good example of me actually reading them, but my, uh, almost my entire, I didn't have a home office before. So in my construction of my home office, I took almost every book I own and I built a desk. And that's the um, yeah. desk is of books. Awesome. Now it's, it presents a problem if you want to let someone borrow <laughs> or you want to read one of those books. And the books that are at my core 
reading thing, reading concept. I can't, I don't really have a term for it, but the five or so books that I, that are right at the center of everything are not a part of the desk. They stay <laughs> out of the desk. Right. But, but I have had a couple instances where the structural integrity of the desk has to be compromised so I can donate, like or allow somebody to borrow a book or so I can pull a book out and reference it. And, but I do think, I do question if your, if your books are all just neatly organized on that shelf, I know a lot of people that read a lot of books. I don't know too many of them who have them organized like that. So, <laughs> however, however, I'm also kind of reflecting now and I think Kendra might have a bookshelf behind her. I think she does too. Yeah. But trust me, Kendra's reading. Oh um, yeah, I was going to say, she might be office, an example. She's feverishly reading. That's how, how most of the books I have, she just got me some books. Um, she got my son some books. I mean, this is the great part about knowing amazing people because, I mean, as they are learning and growing, let me tell you, they cannot keep it to themselves. Yeah. And so I get to benefit from the growth and the learning of all the amazing people I have around me. So it's a blessing. Yeah. <laughs> I, uh, I, I don't do it very much anymore because, um, well, I guess because I'm lazy, but I, I don't, I, I was like my, my way to exercise was CrossFit and I'm a certified CrossFit trainer. And I, 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 the things I love about that are, are have nothing to do actually with the working out. It's the community aspect that hands down is the reason why I loved it and do love it. But I have a couple of friends who make fun of me because they say there's two things that you guarantee Ken's going to talk about every time you see him. He's going to talk about CrossFit because that's what CrossFit people do is they talk about it. And he's going to talk about something he learned. Um, the last, even if you just saw him yesterday, he's going to be like, guess what? <laughs> and most of the time, this is my friend talking, most of the time, none of us care about that thing. And he knows it, but he's going to tell us anyway. So, <laughs> so sometimes my group is the byproduct of they learn things. They don't care about them, but they know them now. Because because I because I care about them. <laughs> so. True educator spoken like a true educator. <laughs> I I kind of want to. You brought up something that I don't even know why I thought of this. Like most of my thoughts, I want to know. Now. It's a bit of a pivot, and as we were talking, well, you were talking about like capitalism and and money, I guess, in general, and how it does drive so much, and understandably why. I was, I was just talking to someone the other day about how like, you do know that money is human created, right? Like it's not, nobody has imposed this on us like oxygen. Like theoretically, if national debts became a problem, everybody could get together and just say, it's gone, <laughs> right? Theoretically, yeah. practically not so, not so realistic, but theoretically, if it became a big problem, it's just like, yeah, Let's leave dollar values the same. Let's leave, let's leave costs the same. Let's, and just go, and now no country has national debt. Again, practically not as applicable, right. but it's important. I think the concept in general, because to some people that like, they can't connect with that. It's like, no, you could never do that. Well, you could, like you could. Yeah, yeah. We are gonna take a minute here just to talk about a book called Press Start. This book is by Craig Burgess. He's a master content creator, and he runs a company called Produce More in the UK. Craig creates a lot of images and collections of ideas that are super unique, and I would highly encourage you to check them out on Twitter, Instagram, or on his website. You can buy Craig's book, Press Start, on boostbuys.net and get 10% off with the discount code RLRP2020. Now let's hear the rest of this awesome conversation with Dr. Afia Fredericks. It's important to remember when, when we're, especially when we're designing and creating and evaluating, like evaluating things like how we teach, how we grade, how we look at profit and loss, sunk costs, that kind of thing. It's like, like money is us created. Bitcoin wasn't anything 10 years ago, 15 mm -hmm. years ago, maybe. And it's, and so it's, so yeah, use it, guide decisions with it as a factor, maybe as your biggest factor, but don't put it on the level of oxygen and sunlight and, and water. Like that's, it's not those, it doesn't fall into a fundamental element that, that we need to survive, whether, and that's debatable in itself. But I, I think that too many times 
because people aren't really thinking about it, the dollar or yen or euro or whatever <laughs> falls into the same category as air, water, sunlight, that kind of thing. Right. And that's dangerous. No, no, that's so true. That's so, but and, and as you were talking, I also think about how easy or difficult would it be for the person who's never had to, to then fully embrace that perspective, that, that thought of really, right. And so it's like, I think about, I think about what puts us in a position where, I'm sorry, I hear talking, I might have a guest or it might be the TV. I'm not sure, but let me know if it starts to get too loud. That's okay. I'm not the even going to edit this out. Oh, great. Thanks. Joys of living with the house. Well, before, before you were talking, and I, I don't know, you would have noticed, but people listen to this on a podcast, and even I'm, I was doing it when the camera was on you, but my dog was just like needed attention. So I'm like ducking and diving and <laughs> trying to throw a toy while maintaining eye contact and then watching it hit like a vase and being like, oh, crap. Go oh, on, though. Goodness. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the iceberg effect, right? Like there's so much happening behind the scenes. Like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a whole production. <laughs> right. Um, but yeah, I also think about the positions that we were, we, we're in and where, just as in general, as people, where we are in, in terms of financially, whether we, and I wouldn't say just have enough, I would say feel like we have enough, right? Because mm. I might have $5 in my pocket, you might have 5000 you might be like, I'm broke. And I'm like, are you really? but not compared to me, but you know what I mean? So it's a matter of perspective, I think. But um, yeah, I wonder about how, what conditions make it easy or difficult to hold that view or to embrace it, for it to resonate, right? Versus reject it. And if you're coming from a situation where you haven't had much and that's been, you know, a, a theme in your life, then I think it might be a lot more difficult for that person to embrace the, oh, so I'm actually rich because I have love. <laughs> like, uh. so it's really, and so I, I always, I try to like look at things from different perspectives and I, I, I it resonates, but I also try to think of what would make it difficult for a person to accept, to embrace, to, you know, I just, I find it, I find it really fascinating to, to look at those different perspectives and, and, and it, to me, it just reaffirms my privilege to be quite honest. Mm. The fact that I can just like, Oh yeah, guess why? Cause I'm quite comfortable. <laughs> you know what I mean? I got a house, I bought it. You know what I mean? Like, so it's easy for me to, to come from that, but um, it, it's, it's, it's fascinating to just think about like the perspective that you're bringing and you're absolutely right. And you think about just what, what happened like hundreds of years ago, it was what an exchange of goods or, and services like yeah. for the other, um, you know, what do you have that I need? What do I have that you need? And, um, and that also made it important to have diversity. Everybody can't be, you know, shoemakers or stargazers, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. Wow, gotta those have. were the two professions that you. <laughs> <laughs> a, 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 a per career stargazer, and and. I was the astronomers, you know, the early philosophers, whatever. <laughs> and they need <laughs> the guy who's looking at the stars needs shoes, and the guy who makes shoes is like, <laughs> I need to know about that star. I know. Let me tell you when I was born. <laughs> 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 that's awesome oh man but no your your point is well noted and taken you're absolutely right that um you know it's man-made and it's you know, and i mean i don't know you think about you know money and and how very rich and wealthy people have have died that money didn't save them and then mm -hmm. my, my mother always says you can't bring you don't ever see a u-haul behind a a, a hearse right I yeah from, i got gotcha. you yeah, you get it you just i mean unless you know you have a specific request um i doubt your things will be going down with you yeah. or wherever you're planning to go after mm -hmm. um 
you transition. But yeah. 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 I, th I think it's, it's interesting to me a lot of times just because I guess, I guess really what we're talking about is the, <laughs> It's it's really funny because I can see you reacting to the noise in the background, but nobody else is gonna get that same level of entertainment. But <laughs> because I'm talking, so the camera's gonna be on me the whole time. Uh, but I want to acknowledge it so everybody knows that you are unimpressed with the sound behind you. Uh, <laughs> when 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 I talk about that, I guess it, it really is kind of furthering that that attitude of gratitude kind of stuff and really really trying to be appreciate trying to find that appreciation but my appreciation is not your appreciation and telling me that I should be more appreciative is like a slap in the face right so it's it, it can be something where we I think I think when we talk about having things like um, I don't know how many people I think this is so ironic whenever somebody's like well you should keep a gratitude journal I don't want to. No, you should. It'll change how you see the world. No, it won't. Because I, I and I'm not trying to seem like superior or, or anything. I'm just saying, I, I think that way. I don't want to write it down. I don't want, because now it's going to be work. Like now it's, <laughs> to me, that's how I see it. It's like, so now I'm super grateful for a home and, and food and the means to, to do what I want to do and that kind of thing. And now I'm writing it down and feeling like it's a task I have to complete at the end of the day. And now I'm not so great. Now it's kind of a pain. Like now I'm not grateful for the gratuity journal or whatever it might be. And, and I'm not, I'm, I think it's a great tool for people that, that don't, aren't in that mindset daily anyway, like being, becoming more aware of it is super important, but don't tell me how to be grateful. By, by, like you should get this journal. No, it'll change your life. Just stop telling me what'll change my life. I'll tell you what'll change my life. <laughs> I think that's so, that actually gets to something really deep in regards to like, if you, I truly believe that we know, we adults know what's best for us. We know what works best or we're the people who would have the best answers, who, who could have the best answers. And everybody is different in their awareness, the level of awareness and tune, in tunement. Is that a word? Did I just create that? Um, how in tuned one is. <laughs> I tuned, I tuned. I tuned, thank you. <laughs> I totally missed the mark. But um, yeah, so we're at different levels in terms of how attuned we are to, you know, ourselves and what we deeply desire and want but um i i i really i think about like religion you know and i think that's a big it's a great example of how people kind of try to pre-impose their beliefs mm -hmm. onto others but when i think about it i think it comes from a genuinely good place of if i think there is a I don't know, a bad place that you go if you don't do things a certain way and a good place that you go and I care about you or people in general, then I want people to, you know, all do these things that are going to lead them to this good place, right? Like, right. I mean, we'll think about all the bad things that have been done in the name of religion as well. That's a whole nother story. But um, when I think about people, you know, pre-imposing things, I think oftentimes it comes from a really good place but i think there's a uh uh this assumption sometimes that because it works for us it, sh it will work for you as well um and i think that's when we try to pre-impose i think that's kind of where we go off but i'm definitely with the the sharing and bringing awareness and i think it's up to individuals to decide for themselves what works best for them or maybe they're not in a place in their lives right now where they can receive and accept what you're saying or the lessons that you're sharing but you know the hope is that as they go through life and have more experiences they'll remember it's like when i talk to educators about growth mindset and they're like oh i try but you know i don't think i don't know if they get it whatever and it's just like if you have a tool belt on your waist you might have a wrench and a flathead and a phillip head and that's obviously all I know about tools, 
But you know, if you have those tools, <laughs> I was gonna see how far you'd go. I was like, <laughs> do I stop you before you make up one? Got it. No, I'm stop myself right there. No, you and killed it. You killed it. Point taken. Um, point made. Uh, hopefully, it was received. But, <laughs> but you know, the idea is that you have those tools, and when you need it, it's there. You can pull it out and use it. And so I think sometimes we forget that part and we immediately want the wrench to be the tool that someone needs to use right now, or we assume that it is because it is for us or whatever the, the, the reasons that we have are. But I think there's something powerful about thinking about lessons and ideas and, you know, and, and knowledge as tools and, you know, we can share it and it's up to people to do what they they please or they think is best with it, whether to throw it away like some garbage. Um, I think it's important for us to uh, evaluate what is coming to us and not just be innocent, well, not innocent per se, but just, you know, just, just be sponges and not really evaluating the quality of the information and what we're right. getting. Just be, you know, kind of mindless consumers, if you will. Yeah. Um, so I do think that is dangerous. You know, the sheep, the blind followers, don't drink the Kool-Aid, you know? Um, uh, yeah, so I think there's, there's, there's something to be said about that, but I don't know, I just feel like if we have more trust for others and also for whatever energy source de deity you believe in that, you know, um, that the same thing that's working for you in your life is the same thing, hopefully, that's going to support others in their lives. And so, you know? We can just support others in their journey and share with others, but we can't do the work for people. You know, mm. we can't force people to receive our message or to receive um, the knowledge that we have that we think is amazing. I'm sure everyone who, you know, wrote a book or did a research project, I'm sure everyone thinks that their, their stuff is golden or whatever, which yeah. is great. You got to believe. You don't believe in you. Who will? But um, at the same time, I, I think that, you know, you allow people to, to, to process it in their way. I think that's important. Um, that's important. Save a lot of time, save people a lot of time and energy, you know, yeah. cool. things down people's throats. Well, I love, I love responding when people are like, well, I don't, I have no idea why I would hire you. And I'm like, yeah, that's fair. I guess I, you, you don't even know that I can teach you something. So I guess I should probably demonstrate that. Like, <laughs> <laughs> and and we do that we do that all the time like we like we end up in situations and i i mean we like teachers and coaches especially because it's like very rarely and this is a this is probably a something that that needs to change or we need to change cult culturally but very rarely now in comparison to how much a teacher is dictating or 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 speaking or imposing a lesson i guess you could say there's, there's a million ways i guess i can describe that does the student come and request a lesson? Like if the ratio of, if the ratio of like, I want to dig deeper or I'm curious about this, or I want like, I know a lot of elementary level teachers and the ratio of kids that are coming to them with like, Hey, I independently went out on my own and found this concept and I want to know more about it to okay, like back up the dump truck and just pour it all over me. Like, <laughs> Hopefully so, so I carry some of it with me through life. Like it's like, it's like one to a hundred thousand. Like, yeah. and, and I know that because every time I'm in a school, there's a, a teacher that has, there'll be one student and the principal or the vice principal or a teacher's gonna be like, you got to talk to this kid. Cause this one, we're killing it with this one. <laughs> there's 700 kids in school, but this one's really good. <laughs> <laughs> right here <laughs> always she's always asking questions she wants to know more about this she comes she teaches us stuff sometimes it's like and and the conversation is often then around well can you like how can you propagate that amongst the rest of them how can you make this the most <laughs> contagious thing that's happening in the world um mm -hmm. and and something that can can be spread a little further i guess where it's like self self driven not just self-guided but self-driven and self-motivated and self-created learning yeah that's tough because I, I i often find when i go into schools or organizations and i speak with educators about growth mindset and 
you know, growing and learning through challenges. And, you know, they often, at some point, they're going to ask about the misalignment of the system that they work under and my message. So it's interesting that, you know, you go to the school and they're like, what about the rest of them? And it's just kind of like, and so how, let's talk about the ways in which the system of, you know, your organization supports what it is that you actually want to see. Mm -hmm. And I don't think people, I think, you know, it's easy for us to do what's always been done. You know, I I know that I've seen it. I'm just going to, you know, just spit that right back out. But um, I don't even know how conscious some of us are on the misalignment of the expectations that we want to see and what we do and how it counters what we're saying. And then think about it from, you know, like childhood, you know, look at how we just came full circle again. Uh, The do as I say, not as I do, you know. Um, So oftentimes, you know, there's a lot of mis. I, I think the key to a lot of that is consciousness and awareness. And oftentimes we're not operating in that manner. And it takes a lot, it takes a little more work and, and time, you know, on the front end to, to dive into that space. Uh, but I think it's, it's worth it. But I think a lot of us are just, you know, we're surviving. We just, we're, we're going through the motions we're trying to pay the bills, get home, take care of the family, you know, do it again the next day. And so, um, and, and I think that's also for me, why it's important for us to really be figuring out what that thing or those things are that make us come alive. Because I think that fuels us when things get really difficult and hard. Um, there's something about when you're operating in that space that, that, I guess you're, you're, you were supposed to, I don't want to say born to, because then that gets into a whole nother, like, wait a minute, you know, but that passion, that thing that makes you come alive, right. And lights you up. And um, also I want to say like with the concept of growth mindset and, and, and improvement being possible, regardless of where you are, I think sometimes there's this um, misconception that that means you're supposed to be striving to be great at every single thing. But the reality is you decide what's important enough for you to, to move forward in. Now, our kids don't necessarily have the same type of freedoms, you know. Oh, I don't want to do math today. Maybe next year. No, it doesn't work that way, right? <laughs> However, um, as adults who have the you know, executive function over our lives for the most part, um, we do get to choose what, what we're more motivated to do, what interests us. And there is a reality that some of us are more interested in some things than others, and for those things that we are, those are the things that we are more than likely uh, are going to apply that growth mindset to because of that fundamental interest, uh, um, passion for that thing. And so I think about the teachers that I, I know that I, I, I kind of look up to or I, I love to, to, to talk with them and see them in action. And they love the work that they do. They are so passionate about that work, you know? And um, there's something, although the system, there's so much room for growth and improvement. There's a lot that they are dealing with on a day-to-day basis. Like, I don't think they would trade that for anything. They love that work that they do. And to me, that's part of what makes the most effective, um, effective dot, 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 yep. an educator, uh, you know, professor, uh, doctor a lawyer uh a writer i'm just trying to like you know, i was really was critical the last time you named jobs <laughs> i came down on you really hard so it's fair um <laughs> yeah uh, <laughs> and a perfect perfect example of instilling a fixed mindset in someone just by one piece of feedback right there um, Where the tongue yeah <laughs> um two quick thoughts and then i want to ask you the hardest question of the whole show um <laughs> the first, the first is that, um, oh, I forgot it. The second is that <laughs> I had, I had a conversation on here. Uh, it's not out, it's not out yet, but by the time yours is out, it will be. So I don't know why I said that, um, <laughs> with, uh, Dr. Dean Dudley and he's an Aussie and he, he'll be a part of our Aussie week where we only release episodes on their time because we have a few guests from there now, but he's a, he's an expert in physical literacy and, and 
I use the term expert because we talked about the fact that he gets called an expert so often. And we did, most of our conversation was actually around the misnomer of expert because I think, I can't remember if I said it, this explicitly, but I, I, I implied something along the lines of there's no such thing as an expert. And because if, if we're talking about mastery, then mastery is just the path and the journey. And, and nobody, nobody can really say they're a master. Nobody can really say they're an expert. Nobody can just check off a box on what they do and who they are and, okay. that, and that those are two separate things. And so when, when we look at the idea of being an expert, being a master or whatever people want, people call it and, and really dig down deeper, it's important to kind of remember that the one, the people with the passion are going to stay on the journey. And because of that, they'll be, they'll be able to, they'll be able to maybe be referred to as, again, in my opinion, incorrectly, as an expert or a master. Um, but it, it doesn't necessarily mean that, that they're done. And the reason why they, they're good is because they know that that's true. Just got a snap for that. That's deep. I love it. I was gonna. I, I was like, this is really awkward for me because I'm pretty sure the camera's gonna stay on me, and you're just nodding. <laughs> so now, but when when you talk when you talk about the teach uh, and we're framing a lot of this around teaching though. Again, like I said before, there, this threads and flows back and forth between business and sport and create other creative pursuits as well. But it's like it takes you two seconds to feel that in a classroom. And that's why schools are so badass is because when you go into that classroom and that teacher is just killing it, you don't, you might, she might, he or she might still be at their desk or, or might be out of the room for a moment, but you feel it when they're not even there. And then when they come in, those of us, those of us where this is where our passion and caring lie, you, it almost brings tears to your eyes because then you watch them with the students. And you watch, you, you watch the students with each other and you watch the students independently on their own. And all of a sudden you're like, wow, this is, I'm, I'm here today to talk about, <laughs> talk about learning and culture. And I haven't even done anything yet and I'm already tearing up and I feel like I learn a ton. And that's where we find some pretty good stuff. Yeah, no, that's powerful. What you just described, you just kind of stated. There's two things that come to my mind. It was the idea of the labels that we give, and then the second part of what you just described. I, I thought about this term that I got when I was in grad school. So my my advisor, there was this this teaching style that he called a warm demander. It's the warmth is from the caring the knowing that this person truly cares about me and wants to see me excel and has high expectations for me. But the demander part is that I essentially demand that you rise up and meet that challenge. I believe that you can, and I'm going to challenge you and I'm going to hold you to that, a warm demander. And when you just describe kind of that atmosphere and those teachers that are passionate and they're, you know, effective, I get both of those things I've gotten from interacting with those teachers. It's like my standards aren't lowered. I'm not lowering my standards because I believe they can, they can meet them, you know? So I hold them accountable. I challenge them, but I care about them. And it, it's not just that I think it, I, I believe it. It's that they feel it and they believe it. Yeah. That's the part. Because we, we think lots of things about ourselves and what we you know, are emitting, what we think we are, our intentions. And that's not always picked up. It's not always received well. But for those who are intentionally doing that and for their students who explicitly feel that as well and they receive that, that's where I think that's, that's magical. Like... And I know like there's research that demonstrates how, like especially in younger learners, they learn for their teachers. If they have a positive relationship with that teacher 
and they feel really good about that environment that they're coming into day after day, they're going to do what they got to do, right? For that teacher, you know, I remember loving subjects because of the educator, because of the teacher I had. Oh my God, I love science this year. Ne next year, maybe not so much. And so it was beyond just the literal subject at those younger ages. It was just that teacher that, you know, that just turned that material into something, whatever they did, however they did it, that moved me or that feeling I got when I got into their classrooms that, you know, um, there's something powerful about that. And for the statement that you made about the labels, mm -hmm. I think it's real. Because when I think about those terms, sometimes it's really triggering, you know, and you think about the expert or, you know, here we go. Hey, babe. Good day. Hi. Hey, Ken. It's Charlie. Charlie, it's Ken. Hey, Charlie. Hey. Appreciate it. Oh, okay. I'm coming out soon. Thanks. Appreciate it. Um, sorry. We, 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 have his, we have guests. And it's okay. We're long. We're long now. Oh, cut that one out. All right. <clears throat> so, <laughs> you're like, not going to do it. Nope. <laughs> Working from home. Pandemic. <laughs> um, but so, yeah, in regards to the, the, the idea of this, this expert, this master. So, um, so I'm an adjunct um, lecturer and I, I teach typically research methods and statistics. And the students truly believe that you come out the womb knowing this stuff. They're like, oh my gosh, Dr. Fredericks, you're just, you just know this, you know? Um, and my goal when they come into my class, it's typically psych majors. When they come into my class, my goal is to break that barrier down and for them to see themselves in me. And I have to make it explicit that the only difference between them and me is the amount of years and time and the amount of times I've failed and made mistakes and the hard work I've put in. That's the only difference between me and them. And there's this constant need to remind them of that. But when I think about the, the label, the expert, it, it, it resonates with me in terms of like, what does that really mean? I think that's the challenge in how society, like how society has, has, has defined that or what typically is thought of or meant when you use that term, that what's attached to it, right? Same thing like intelligence and smart, right? Like that fixed idea of um, what many of us, it, it, we feel like it's implied in the term itself and how it's used. But I, I, I feel like that's it, that those are the people who've stuck with something longer. And really what you're designating between is people, their passion and the amount of time and the knowledge base that they have in a thing because of how feverishly or how long and, um, you know, how much work and time they put into learning and understanding. And like you said, it never stops. It keeps going. So they will just continue to, to learn and grow as, you know, our potentials are, un they're unlimited and it's limitless. Yeah. And I, I'm, I'm going to tie that all together really nice. And then I'm going to, ask you your hard question of the day mm -hmm. um, and just give an example, I guess, where, and, and as somebody who, draw, who runs a company now that's, that's data-driven, trying to be more data-driven all the time, this may either help or drastically hurt our business, but I'm going to say it anyway. And it's that when I took my undergraduate statistics class, first time around, I failed it. Second time around, I passed it with a 58 or something. Passed it as a 58? Yeah. That, that's what, okay. you know, I, it counts. I got it. <laughs> got the credit. Um, maybe it was higher than a 58, but I'm pretty sure it's 58 because that's how I've been telling the story forever. But no then masters, um, did totally different, totally different instructor, totally different setting, much smaller group yeah. as well. I finish quantitative and quanti quantitative. So I'm not a, I'm not a super mathematical mind, but I finish quantitative methods or qu quantitative research methodology, something like that. Quantitative was in the title. It was very numbers heavy. I got an 88 first try. Now one, I did work way harder, but two, I was in a group about, let's say a 10th the size. I had a teacher that really cared about me and really cared about helping me do well. And all of a sudden, all of a sudden, the, the grade in a much more challenging class 
as opposed to an intro statistics course is way higher. And I, I'm not even kidding. Like I didn't even look at my grade once the whole semester until the end uh-huh. because I was just doing, I was just, I was just engaged. And I think that the, like you working in that world and, and then also understanding the fact that the, the methodology of delivery and, and the environment of delivery is going to be extremely important in helping people understand it. And like how important is understanding statistics now? People got to know that shit. Yeah. More people have to know, at least a passing understanding. So much not like it's, it's in everything. It's everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. It's important. Like society period. Just understand end values and power. And you're going to change how you look at almost everything. (laughs) Every, every (laughs) Every statement that comes out in media, you're going to be like, Hmm. Yeah. What's that what you mean? <laughs> um, I don't want to keep you because you have guests over and your husband, though that was the first time we met, uh, <laughs> didn't seem like he was that happy with me. So it's really about me. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, the time. but go ahead. <laughs> but the the well actually before the question, if people want to follow you, socials, oh, is there anything like that that you are on actively? or that you would want people to follow you on, or um, is there another place you would send people? Yeah, that's a really good question. So LinkedIn, I'm on LinkedIn, Afia Fredericks, PhD. Uh, I'm on Facebook as well. I am really warming up to the idea. I'm that person on Facebook that, um, you know, I've been on there from before. You could get an account if you did not have a college email address. Mm. If you remember those days, but I was there then. <laughs> so I've like grandmothered a whole lot of people into that. But um, I also have a, a Facebook page, Afia um, Fredericks, and every every so often I am uh, enlightened and motivated. I, I add to that, you know. But uh, so there's LinkedIn, there's Facebook, um, and of course MindsetWorks.com. Uh, you can find me there as well as. I am the director of professional learning there. So that's one of the coolest titles ever. Director of professional learning. Yeah. Well, it's longer than that, but what what's so cool about it, Ken? I just think I just think it's it just I, sounds badass. <laughs> I appreciate that. Yeah, yeah it's, it's it's fun stuff. I love like it. I need to change. I'm gonna read. I'm gonna find somebody else to be founder, and I'm gonna change. I'm just, <laughs> so you can have a cool hey, title. You've been promoted. You're the founder and owner now, and I'm gonna be the director of professional learning. <laughs> Cause, <laughs> oh man! Well, um, but yeah, so the question I ask everyone, and this oh, is a hard I, question. It's okay, going to be I mean, hard. I think it might be hard I'm for you, stretch. or or you're going to rock it out because you might just have this. <laughs> I, it's one or the other for everybody in teaching and coaching. I find is that if you had to give your best advice on learning and growing in a phrase or two, what would it be? as my background noise distracts me from my thoughts it's good ambiance for the podcast (laughs) Uh, learning and growing this seems like a good time also to point out what a fixed mind mindset moment might look like where you're trying to come up with the perfect response and not just hitting it quick. Ah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's good. That's good. Um, yeah, no, I'm thinking one, it's a process. I think I really wanted some, uh, more, uh, some more mm, to it but um it's a process so be patient be patient it's another one it's a process be patient and um it's all part of the same long run on sentence by the way Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and uh, it never stops never stop Nice. Damn, that's somebody's catch. I don't know who needed to hear that, but that right there, 
it's simple, <laughs> it's digestible, and it's it's deep when you really sit with that. Yeah. But yeah, it's a and process. Humble. <laughs> Just all of that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the hardest thing for people that talk a lot, right? It's hard, yeah. In a few words. Yeah. What is that? Like, what are you, what are you, what are you limiting my potential? <laughs> yeah. No, but that's hard. But yeah, I think that's, yeah, awesome. I think. I'm well, I, I appreciate, I think that you, even with how hard, not everybody who listens to this will be able to see the labor, the mental labor that went into that because <laughs> the thinking face was real, but I think, I think it comes out really tight. I'm sorry. I forgot we were at the podcast because I'm like looking at myself right now, but I should have grunted like, you know, so you would know what was happening. Cause yeah. anyway, could be a tennis you. player trying to think of something. We don't know. <laughs> <laughs> as soon as, as soon as that aggressive grunting comes in for every effort, it's like she started playing tennis middle of the show. Legit. It's legit. Yeah. Um, (laughs) no i i really appreciate you coming on i know we've talked a lot and i'm not surprised that this is going to be the longest episode we've ever had based on how our previous you know what maybe just make a part one and a part two i don't know try to figure out how to break that up because it could you know i I can't i can't and here's why because dr coates didn't get a part one and part two and we actually stopped saying we were going to do a part two and one day we probably will do a part two. So, but we didn't, we didn't record it all at once. So now that I've said no to her age old teacher thing, I just said no to, I just said no to Kendra. This is what I'll say. This is what I'll say. I mean, in the spirit of growth mindset and growing and learning from our our mistakes and our past, there's always a chance. Okay. (laughs) Never say never. (laughs) Okay. Now you're just adding on to the, the thing from before. You're just trying to break the, the two phrase limit. <laughs> if, I, if you say it five minutes later, it still counts as the original thing. <laughs> Caught me. Caught me. Caught me, Ken. <laughs> but I do. I, I really appreciate you coming on and sharing everything. And, and the awesome thing is I, th- I think that we're this when, when we talk, about, especially about the education side and, and the, the really odd economic twist that we ended up going, going on in the middle of it. <laughs> Um, but, but important too, I think, and and really being able, being able to have people who are in any field understand that the mindsets that, that you're talking about, because people tell me all the time, well, isn't that that, isn't that that thing for schools? Like when, when, if I talk about growth mindset, the amount of times that I'm with a business or something like that, it's like, oh yeah, like my kid talks about that in her grade six class. Like, well, tell you right now your kids learning more impactful stuff than you are so <laughs> like it's it's really i think it's really good and it's really important that that people hear the value in all these this not just the concepts but the philosophy and the the place that it, that it puts people in for growth and, and development and change and and i appreciate you being super real and no i'm not going to edit out any of this <laughs> uh somehow makes me nervous ken yeah. Husband's, husband's gonna be famous <laughs> he might be he might be in an auto-tuned video but but yeah I, I i appreciate you i appreciate you being on here so much it was a lot of fun and maybe we have to do a part two anyway maybe we will maybe we will thank you so much ken i appreciate you taking time out to to, to talk to me and to listen to me talk i appreciate you <laughs> cool take care all right you too Please make sure you subscribe to Real Learning with Real People on YouTube, Spotify, SoundCloud, Apple Podcasts, or anywhere you get podcasts. And check out boostbuys.net for some really cool purchases at our marketplace.